morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions today, please type them into the Q&A icon located at the bottom toolbar, and we'll answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the December 20th edition of Crop Talk. And whereas we're getting closer and closer to the end of the year, I uh, thought it was a good opportunity to maybe look back and set, uh, at one of the crops that uh, are a couple of the crops that are, uh, they grow some years and then they go down in product or some years in acres. And uh, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to get Dennis Lang to come on today and to look at last year's uh, pulse crops and uh, and soybean crops and maybe talk about some of the things he experienced during the year, what he's seen what to, and maybe what to look for in the, in the coming year. And then after that, we'll have uh, maybe a few questions and uh, go from there. But let's turn it over to Dennis and get started with a uh, look at the 23 pulse and soybean crops. Yeah, thanks, Lionel. We'll uh, just get set up here and uh, get ourselves going here. Back up to the top here. There we go. All righty. So, yeah, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Year in Review. Let's get into it here. Let's look at some of the things that we saw this year and, and uh, some of the things to kind of keep in mind for next year. I'm um, going to start off here today just, just looking at the seeded acres compared to uh, 2022. Oops, very sensitive this morning. Okay. Um, we're looking here at soybeans. We did see an increase in soybean acres. We're looking at about 1.5 million acres in 2023. Uh, that's an increase from uh, the previous year at 891,000. Um, that increase uh, in 2022, we had a very late spring. Uh, growers decided to maybe hold off on growing soybeans and, and switch more to canola. And, uh, you know, this year we've seen that recovery. For field peas, we're down a bit on field peas. We're sitting at 145,000 acres this year and compared to the 187 last year. And uh, dry beans, that one surprised me a bit. Um, it was a little bit uncertain to where we would end up with for acres uh, during the winter months. You know, everybody's talking, you know, 115, 120,000 acres, kind of like what we had in 2022. And when it was all said and done, we had about 138,000 acres. So um, definitely some a few more acres went in than expected. But uh, let's have a little closer look at uh, a few things here now. Um, just kind of looking at, you know, where the yields were this year. For field peas, as I said, peas uh, did drop slightly in acres from the previous years. Uh, most regions this year were, were ranging anywhere from 40 to 60 bushels, which is a pretty typical year. Um, the provincial yield is expected to be somewhere around 50 bushels an acre, which is slightly below that five-year average of 54. Uh, but overall, good quality. Um, and uh, growers were fairly happy with what they had this year, given some areas did not receive a lot of rainfall this year. Um, along with that lower rainfall is lower disease pressure. Um, fungicide application did occur uh, on fields with dense canopy for Nipersprella, but generally growers were, you know, um, pleased, I guess, with the fact that uh, they might be able to get away with just one application this year. Um, so with soybean acres, with that increase in acres, uh, this past year, uh, everyone is expecting some big yields, especially coming off of 2022, where we broke a provincial record at 45 bushels an acre. And this year, though, those first fields coming off in early September, uh, 20 to 30 bushel an acre. And, you know, growers were a little concerned. Uh, but really, if your soybeans are coming off that early, that tells me that there really wasn't enough moisture to really get a good crop. As harvest uh, progressed, we started to see some 30 to 40 bushel yields come in. And then we started to see, you know, the big differences in uh, where growers were uh, receiving moisture. Um, the highest that I've heard uh, this year was at 61 bushel an acre. That was on 160 acres. Um, but that area pretty much captured every rain that you could have received through the season. It was just almost perfect timing on it. And it was, they were in early as well. So they had a good stand to start with. Um, something interesting this year and I didn't put it in the slide set, but I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention them as far as soybean production goes. Um, there was a lot of uneven emergence this year in areas that were quite dry. And in one particular area, the grower had planted 160,000 seeds per acre in a 30-inch row. And normally that's his normal practice. 
And, uh, you know, about two to three weeks later, we started to see the beans emerge. And the problem that we were having is that some of that seed was sitting in dry dirt. And when we did stand counts, we were down to 60,000 seeds or plants per acre, which is quite a significant drop from the 160 planted. And so we monitored that field for the summer. And, you know, I was kind of expecting, you know, maybe to get a few more plants um, recovering. Uh, but really, because that seed has been sitting there for over a month uh, in that dry soil, and this would have been sitting from May to maybe later part of June, uh, wasn't expecting much out of that field. In the end, uh, they did get some moisture on that field, and the field ended up uh, just shy of 50 bushel an acre. And all those seeds that I thought were dead actually made it through. Uh, not something I would normally see on, on a year when we have dry conditions. Sometimes that seed swells up. And then it just dies off because there's not enough moisture to continue. Um, wasn't really too concerned about maturity because I know soybeans, once they hit that critical period in September, uh, they start shutting down. Um, not as big, a, not as big an issue. Um, but um, overall, pretty happy with uh, with with most of the yields that we've seen around the province this year. Uh, with dry beans, they perform pretty well. They they typically do well on drier years. Uh, yields range anywhere from 1,400 to just over 3,000 pounds an acre. And again, that 3,000 pounds an acre were areas that did receive uh, rainfall and uh, timely rainfalls. And um, overall, we're probably looking at a slightly below average yield uh, this year, uh, somewhere around that 1,700 pounds per acre across all different bean types. So market share, what do we grow this year in soybeans? Um, big change, I guess, or we'll call it maybe a small change, I guess. But this is the first time that the Syngenta variety S007-Y4 was not the number one most planted. Um, it just got edged out by our, our new check in our provincial Eastern trial, the P006A37. 7.2% um, for the uh, P006A37 and 7.1%. So just slightly edged out. Um, when you look at that top 10 uh, grown in Manitoba, you will generally see uh, some good yields, or I, I guess you'll, ge you'll generally see a lot of extend beans in that top 10. Um, as you can see here, anything with the uh, R, R2X behind it would be an extend bean. Um, the Y4s are still at uh, Roundup Ready 2 soybeans. And most of the varieties are in that early to mid cat season category, with one uh, exception here when you're looking at the uh, S007A2XS, which is a kind of a mid to late or uh, longer season variety. So, but generally um, yields have been pretty good on, on these varieties. And we, we did move to that new check this year in a provincial trial. Uh, we tend to do that every two years. So if you're, that's the part of the reason we're doing that. And we also want to try to follow what, uh, what growers are producing. So that's why we change those checks around. So uh, yeah, um, field fee market share, you know, 154,000 acres here reported from MASC this summer. Um, our check for this year in our provincial trial uh, is AAC Carver. We've moved away from our previous check, um, but that represents about 22% of the acres. And, and again, most of the yellow is in that top 10. If you kind of look at, you know, kind of long-term P acres and yields, uh, as we said, uh, P yields are going to be in that 50 bushel per acre range. I'm going to actually just use my pointer here and give me okay, myself a pointer. Okay, so around that 50 bushel per acre range, acres were down a bit, but generally P yields have been increasing and have been pretty steady at that increase over the last number of years, uh, going back to 2018. We've had some drier years in 18, uh, well, 17 previously, 18, 19, um, 21 was just too dry, but generally the P yields have been pretty, pretty consistent. So I think probably a, a key to that success is, is we're really looking at peas as a specialty crop. Uh, we're watch, watching our rotations. We're keeping it in that one and six year rotation where we can, putting on the on uh, uh, ground that uh, is not really that does not have a lot of problems with the phenomyces. Uh, we still do see a little bit of that from time to time, depending on rainfall. But generally, P yields have been pretty good over the last number of years. Uh, with dry beans, it's kind of the same trend. Um, you know, we're putting dry beans on on good ground that is well suited, well drained. Uh, gets good moisture, but not over an overabundance of moisture. Again, 21 was a, a poor year for, for dry beans because we our yields were uh, in that 1,300 pound range. But again, just almost too dry. But generally, um, have, the yields are really good. And last year, especially, I think we broke a record there at sitting at around 20, 2,300 pounds per acre. 
So when you look at a 10 year average, we're looking at 1,776 pounds per acre for overall driving classes. And for the five year average, we're looking at 1860. So a little bit better on the short term. Uh, by class, I'm just gonna do a quick comparison here where we saw the increase in from 2023 or from 2022. Uh, Navy's pretty similar in acres. Uh, Pinto beans, that's where we saw a, a bigger increase there. We we're up uh, about 20,000 acres from the previous year. Uh, black beans, uh, again, another uh, another 10,000 uh, acre uh, increase from the previous year. Those are the two big ones. Uh, kidneys, cranberries, all very consistent. And other colors were up slightly. The other colors include things like great northerns and pink beans. So um, growers have a good uh, wide range of uh, classes that they do grow in, in the driving market. Uh, I'm going to mention fava beans here. There's been a little bit of a renewed interest in fava beans. Um, companies such as Roquette has expressed some interest in and using fava beans in a, in a, as a protein market. Um, Prairie Fava uh, has been doing some work with that and, and uh, they have some varieties available as well as DL seeds. Um, and they've been kind of working with some of these lines. Uh, we saw a, a, a huge drop in 2022 because fava beans are a long season crop. Uh, we're less than 500 acres in 2022, but those acres recovered slightly here uh, this, this past year at 3,200 and expected yield this year is around 2,400 pounds per acre. Uh, one of the challenges we've had with that market in the past is, is that um, it's always on the export side where there's a concern because we're competing with areas that uh, you know, generally produce a lot of their own. And uh, sometimes it's difficult for Manitoba fava beans to make it into that marketplace. But there, are, there is some work being done on favas, not only on the, you know, the end use side, but also on the variety development side. Uh, the market share that we have this past year, um, Allison Snowbird, are in the top three of, of those varieties. Now we have both tannin lines and low tannin lines uh, grown in Manitoba. Um, the no variety category would be what I would consider the bin run category, which is still a large share of that market right now. So they're looking for different feed markets there. But I, I'm expecting over the next few years to see a lot more work being done with that. If you look at our variety trials this year from Seed Manitoba, um, you have the information on your tannin and low tannin varieties. Um, generally, yields have been pretty good. We're, you know, 4,200 uh, pounds per acre in our variety trials. And this year, we saw some good numbers at the various sites here. Uh, anywhere Dauphin did really well. So if you're up in that Dauphin area, 6,160 uh, pounds per acre is what we had in the trials there. Um, pea leaf weevil is one of the uh, insect pests that we'll have to deal with. Not going to get into that um, in this particular discussion, but if you are looking at uh, growing fava beans up in the, if those more north and northwest regions, um, it will you need you will need to investigate the pea leaf weevil a little bit more and maybe do a little bit of seed treatment as as uh, uh, prep work. There's really not much you can do in crop. There are some insecticides registered, but uh, generally the uh, they they tend to uh, nibble on the uh, nodules and that's where your yield loss can occur. You'll see that little leaf snipping on the lower leaves uh, on the plant that that uh, uh, that can and that can be an indicator that you do have a problem. For the most part, it's been in the north and, north and west, but I believe this year they did find some um, uh, more in that, um, you know, um, uh, more a little bit further east, I guess, or a lot further east, I guess, um, in that uh, Somerset, uh, Somerset region there. And uh, so, again, something just to kind of keep in mind moving forward. So this is something new for this year, lupins. Um, this year, they're, they're, uh, we've been able to take on a variety trial in two locations, in Millet and Carberry. And um, they, uh, it's a protein market. And this is some slides from Scott Chalmers. He's one of the contractors that's doing the work for uh, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers on these lupin trials. Uh, what we're testing is the white and blue lupins. Uh, the blue lupins are, are longer. The sweet white lupins are a little bit later. And we're doing some uh, comparison to pea yields just to kind of um, give growers some information. I'll show that informa information in, the, in a second. With lupins, um, uh, with some of the perks, they're drought tolerant, uh, they're uh, drought tolerant late in the season. Uh, they are phanomyces resistant, and that is, I think, where it might fit into a P rotation to if you're looking at growing another pulse. Um, and uh, there are, there might be some concerns with, with admixture, but uh, what you are looking at, though, is if it might allow you to incorporate lupins into maybe one every third year or fourth year and still grow, um, still grow peas further on down the line. Um, the protein content is quite high as well in lupins and that's why there's interest in that. Um, and 
Some of the concerns though, is right now there's no real registered herbicides. There's a few different products like using, you know, pre-merged products that you can use. Um, and, uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, blister beetles can be a real concern with that. Um, we did lose the uh, carberry trial to um, insect damage this year. So that was something that, uh, um, that's something that they have to be on top of a little bit more in future years. Uh, inoculant availability, because it is specific uh, inoculant, that is something that's going to be a bit of a challenge. And it's the IDC can be like soybeans as well. So we, it's uh, one of those varieties that uh, you have to be a little careful on the salts and the, and the carbonates. Um, this is from the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. Uh, you'll find this data being listed on their tables here. Um, when you start comparing the blue lupins, blue lupin yields this year anywhere from uh, 26 to 30, 36 bushels per acre in our variety trials. Um, lodging score, they tend to stand very nicely. Uh, the sweet white lupins, those are the ones that typically have been growing on the commercial size fields in Manitoba here uh, over the last uh, two years. And uh, the yields in our trials this year ranged anywhere from uh, 40 to 38 uh, all the way up to 42 bushels an acre. And when you compare that against peas in the same trial, um, you know, peas are generally going to be out yielding them, but uh, they do have uh, some, uh, some definite uh, bonuses that we're going to look at a little bit more so for, for lupins in the future in that protein market. One of the IDC and soybeans, um, we think we're almost done with IDC, I guess, in, in some respects. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we do have uh, uh, a number of varieties that we can work with, but I think it's always good for a refresher to make sure that uh, you know what you're looking at with, with IDC and you know how to pick the right variety for your field. In C Manitoba, you'll have you know the variety description table, which will have, of course, your variety names here. And then there's a column that says IDC rating and grouping. So in this rating and grouping, um, if you're scoring a 1.7 or lower, that's considered tolerant. Uh, if you're scoring a 2.3 or higher, that's considered susceptible. Anything in the middle is, is semi-tolerant. So a semi-tolerant variety, as you see here in this image to the right, um, you'll see when IDC symptoms start to show up, you'll see that intervening chlorosis in that second to third trifoliate stage. And with the semi-tolerant variety, they may yellow, but generally within a week or so, they'll green up again and you probably won't notice much of a difference. Um, if you start growing varieties though that are IDC susceptible and you have a field that has high carbonates and salts, those symptoms can persist up through the fifth to sixth um, um, trifoliate stage. And if they're, if they're doing that, then it's generally affecting the yield because you'll see shorter stunted plants, intravein chlorosis, you'll see some necrotic tissue on it. And that's where you need to be a little bit careful. So what we do for variety trials, and so this is not the company ratings that we use. We actually have a site close to Winnipeg that we've been doing for years. And I'm the one that generally does the ratings and have been doing the ratings since 2011. Um, we plant all our varieties in single row plots in a given area, and there's three replicates of each variety. So that's a total of nine ratings if you're going out through over a three week period, we go once a week. Uh, sometimes I might go the fourth time as well, just to verify. And some years I've even gone five times if uh, symptoms persist. Generally these ratings can go up and down and I'll show you those ratings in a second. Um, but if they improve, that, that tells me that that variety is, is still okay. If they deteriorate, well, that tells me that a grower picking a variety needs to be a little careful about choosing that variety on uh, high, or high uh, salt and carbonate fields. And then once I get all that data together, I compile it into long-term tables. So here's an example of a variety that would be considered tolerant. So the first time I go out on week one in the first rep, it's rating at 1.5, and the second rep, 1.5, and the third rep, 1.7. And I come back the second week, I see that it's, it's basically the same and third week, the same as that. So there's, that's how I come up with my 1.6. Uh, I will then, once I've finished my ratings, I will then bring in the previous year's ratings that I have in the seed guide and put them you know, side by side and do kind of an average compilation of the two. What I do find that's interesting because I've been doing it so long, most times I pretty much come back with the almost the exact same score uh, as previous years, maybe uh, off by just a slight amount, like a 1.7 versus 1.6. But I generally don't see, you know, big swings from a 1.8 to a 2.5. That generally doesn't happen because the susceptible lines always tend to show up uh, as susceptible. With the susceptible line example here, uh, first time going out, we're rating at 2.4. Um, and then the second rep at 2. 
and then the third rep at 2.2, which is still, you know, the second and third rep is still considered uh, semi-tolerant. But then when I come back the second week, I noticed that the, the second rep and, and the third rep have increased in IDC susceptibility or symptoms have increased. So those scores become higher. In the end, I come up with a 2.3. That would be considered susceptible. Um, and what I want to, what we do with this trial is we want to make sure that we want to know which varieties are tolerant and which varieties are susceptible. So this is kind of the worst of the worst, the field that we, that we use, the carbonates and salts are extremely high. And, um, and then to induce IDC symptoms in the susceptible variety, we'll spray it with Pfeiffer. And uh, because of that, Amazimox component to it, it tends to put an added stress onto the crop and those symptoms tend to show up a bit more. So what does that mean as a grower? Um, well, when you're making your field selections for soybeans, you should get yourself a soil test and have an idea where your carbonates and your salts are. So this is an example of, of uh, soil tests here from one of my fields. Um, the carbonate levels is 5.9%, which is considered high. Um, the soluble salts are 0.87 micromoles per centimeter. We then flip over to the uh, mental pulse and soybean grower soybean fertility fact sheet. Now this is developed from an AgVice uh, template. And you'll see here this nice little table. So we said we were above five and we were at 0.8 for the salts, which is uh, right in here. So that would tell me that we're at a very high risk for IDC. So in that situation, what I would want to do then is I would want to pick a variety that has a 1.7 or lower score and plant the variety on that field versus let's say you're out in the Carmen area and your, your carbonates are, and salts are quite low. And, and, and let's say you fall into this category here, um, then you might have a little bit more flexibility because it might be a variety that uh, will perform very well in your, on your field if you have carbonates and salts. And you, so it doesn't eliminate the variety from, from contention for growing, but you just have to be more selective when you're picking a, a susceptible line and where you put it. This, this is a big topic for this year. This is something that uh, lots of time has been spent looking at fields this year, water hemp. Uh, there's an article in Seed Manitoba this year uh, talking about the exact thing. Uh, our wheat specialist, Kim Brown here, is standing in a, in a, along the edge of a field with a mixture of, um, of water hemp and pigweed and, and a bunch of, and, um, and, um, and green pigweed in there as well, or Powell's, another name for it as well, in that mix. And this is on the edge of a soybean field. And again, you know, in this situation, um, we need to really be, we need to be aware of what's going on in our, in our fields. Because I think because of the seed set is so high in these things, if you have it in your field and you're not taking care of it before you put, uh, before you put the combine in the field, you're yeah. going to spread that around. So right now we have a total of 20 uh, RMs that have been confirmed to have water hemp uh, in it. And the big, the big ones this year were in Emerson Franklin and in, um, and in the Salaberry here, just across the river. Those are the two big ones for this year. And why it's so important to really have an idea of, of you know, whether or not you have it in your field, I guess the first thing you need to do is you need to be able to identify. It. So it's a pigweed, but the main difference between the, the redwood pigweeds and the um, water hemp is that when you, when the plants get a little bit bigger and you feel that stem, that stem is super smooth in water, uh, water hemp. It's, it's kind of like the coating on an electrical, uh, electrical wire, it's that smooth, whereas uh, uh, pigweed is, is quite rough. This is a drone shot from a field and you can see my, me standing in a field here, um, standing in a little lighter colored area. And that was the, that was the, um, the water hemp patch that I was standing in. So now I'm gonna hit my enter button here. So that's where I am. Now you can see all these little yellow patches throughout the field. And I kind of stopped there because there's you know lots more besides that. So in this particular field here, you can tell the pattern of seeding and harvest is always kind of the same direction. So it was spread probably over multiple years. And again, this year, because of the, you know, the drier conditions that we had at certain times, the hotter conditions, uh, the water hemp just really kind of moved, moved along and uh, saw some really good uh, growth, I guess, through the season. And um, one more about it back in there. And so the concern here in this particular field was that it wasn't extended soybean. So that's a good starting point. The only problem was it was not sprayed with a dicamba on the first pass. 
because they thought, you know, we'll just go with Roundup and, you know, we don't have a lot of weed pressure. And then lo and behold, they find these plants that you see here, and then they come back and spray them. And they were sprayed probably at the height that you see right now. So again, not a whole lot that chemistry is going to do for. You can see here with, uh, with Kim's hand here, the, the plants are a little bit twisted, but really not a whole lot, uh, not a whole lot of damage to that plant. So the really, once you see it at that stage, the really only thing you can do is, is either, you know, is to destroy it. So that means going out and hand pulling and making sure you get all the roots out um, before it goes to seed and spending time and doing it. Um, now in this particular field, and this is all from the same field here, um, this was about five hours of work with five people. And again, you can see here quite a substantial amount of water hemp that was removed, but a lot more, uh, a lot more in that field as well. This is from a, from the previous year, but this just illustrates how prolific a seed producer this is. This was taken towards the end of September. And you can see here this particular water hemp uh, seedling here. Um, the plants had frozen the night before, the leaves are kind of limp. But when you shell it out, you can see here all the viable seed and just from that one plant. So the key with, with managing water hemp, I guess a, a few things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, when it comes to your soybean fields, um, scout your field after each herbicide application and watch for escapes. That's probably the first step. Um, making sure that once you spray, come back about a week later, look for any escapes, look for water, look for plants, that, uh, weeds that did not get killed off um, and uh, get those plants out of the field if you see them there. Uh, water hemp generally will start off in smaller patches if it's just moving in as one or two plants. Either it can move in through waterways, it can move in through birds, it can move in through equipment. Um, and, uh, but if it's brought into a field and left unmanaged, uh, it can really produce a lot of, a lot of seeds. And it's something that you really need to be aware of. And, uh, as you go through the season, watch for your, uh, watch your soybean fields for, for, uh, as a crop matures. Uh, this past fall, we saw a lot of soybeans maturing in later part of August. And you have these big, tall green plants in the field and you need to go out and you need to remove those. Um, I've had, uh. Um, a story relayed to me of a, um, a of a field that had water hemp in it and just the odd plant and actually the uh, grain cart driver was out uh, would, when they'd have a bit of a break because you know it would go out and pull plants and get, get them off the field so you won't uh, spread that throughout the field. Um, so identify and remove and destroy those weeds in the field. It is a tier one noxious weed so it needs to be needs to be taken care of and needs to be destroyed. Uh, Try to use multiple modes of action. So if you're using, let's say, a pre-merge um, on your soybeans, if you think you have a problem, if you're using the dicamba and list systems, which is what you probably should be do using now, um, you need to use that pro those products on the first path with the glyphosate. You can't let it go and, and put it on later on if uh, because those weeds will not be taken care of if they're if they get too big. Um, at this point, I think glyphosate alone can really run you into problems right now. I think uh, just kind of keeping an eye on what you have in your fields, and that's something you have to be aware of. So I get to, I wanted to show this slide. Um, we don't we haven't had frost on beans uh, since about 2021. We had a little bit of frost in some areas. This year, well, actually, this was north of Carmen, uh, kind of up in that uh, um, hoop and holler area there. So we had some frost on black beans. A girl called me up to the field here this year. You can see those limp leaves. Um, part of the reason they have a frost on it, I guess, is there was a lot of delayed emergence to that dry conditions that we had this year. And the overall crop, as you can see here, was still quite green. And the temperatures actually dropped to minus four for about four to five hours. So it was a pretty hard frost. But those leaves kind of protected the pods. And uh, the grower was concerned about what, the, what they should do in this particular field because, you know, should you desiccate it? Should you just leave it? So so we went out and I looked at it, looked at the seeds and I took a few plants home. And you can see here, when we pull those plants uh, and left them for about a week here, you can see those seeds that uh, aren't gonna fill here in those pods here. Uh, the recommendation was just to leave it be because really you know, spraying uh, with the desiccant at this stage, the frost is taking care of that green leaf material. Um, they did have to leave it for quite a while uh, for everything to really mature. But in the end, um, the grower was quite fortunate that actual seeds didn't freeze because if the seeds freeze, then they turn a grayish color and they go as damage or pick in your sample. And that's a larger discount. And uh, what the producer did see on those plants that, uh, that, were, that had seeds that were immature, 
um, those seats were a lot smaller. Dockages were uh, dockages were definitely uh, definitely higher in the, some of those fields, uh, eight to twelve percent. But generally, the quality was pretty good, and the yield actually was quite respectable. It was in that fifteen to sixteen hundred pound range, so they were pretty uh, uh, pretty you know satisfied, I guess, with with what they had this year because it could have been much worse. But I think what probably saved it this year was the fact that there was a lot of green material there um, that saved the seed. But if they would have had better moisture through the growing season, they would have had a more even maturing crop come September and probably wouldn't have had an issue at all with frost. But that's just sometimes what you have to deal with. Whereas with the soybean in the same situation as the previous story I related, uh, the soybeans, once that uh, critical day length was triggered in early September, they started to mature and no real issues there. So that's the difference between a, a dry bean and a, and a soybean there. Um, I throw this one slide up here. This is from one of our variety trials. Uh, most of the varieties we grow now and we test are in that very early, early to mid season category. We don't, uh, we have a few longer season ones, but typically it's not like it used to be back in the, uh, back in around 2012, 2013, where we had a few, uh, quite a few more longer season ones. But every once in a while, we do get one that's quite a bit mature, uh, longer maturing. And uh, so this was taken towards the end of September, um, probably around the 20th of September, give or take, where you have your mid-season variety fully mature and you have your really long season, which is, you know, anywhere upwards of 10 days longer than the, than the check, um, that if you would have had a frost at that stage would be a little bit different story. You'd have a lot more, you could have some uh, potential issues with uh, frost damage seed. So Again, we do get a few of these, but they're not as common, but it just brings home the point that if you're looking at trying longer season beans in your region, just kind of keep that in mind because uh, you don't want these things to be finishing off any later than what you need um, and, and increase your risk of frost. Um, I throw this slide up here just for a few things to kind of think about for next year and leave, uh, and moving forward. I try to do this, you know, every, every few years, it's kind of remind growers. Um, so in this situation, what can happen is uh, you decide to plant a dry bean, like a pinto bean in this case on the field that had soybeans um, two years ago. And what can happen is soybeans can volunteer two years after initial planting. I've seen it many times. And in dry beans, it's a real concern because soybeans are considered a food allergen. And it's, it can be difficult to separate out in the cleaning process. So I always encourage growers to watch your rotation, uh, keep two full complete growing seasons between soybeans and dry beans, um, just to make sure that there's no, no issues. So not just every second year, but two full complete growing seasons to keep that in mind so that you don't run into that problem. And uh, in certain market classes like navy beans, for example, uh, going over to the UK, they want no soybeans in it at all. So the buyers are very particular about that. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, I've seen even soybeans volunteer in peas as well two years after. Now, the, the difference with peas is peas are a lot earlier and a lot of times that seed and soybeans are green by the time the peas are mature and it's not as much of an issue um, from the rotational, the side of, uh, rotational side of things. But it is something to kind of keep in mind if you end up getting a, a, a season where the pea Peas come up a little bit later and the soybeans get to a point where they end up in the sample. And that's not, that's for some buyers, that's that's not a, that's something that they would like. Uh, this is an older slide, but it kind of illustrates the point about be selective on where you put your dry beans versus your soybeans. Um, so this is the same field and uh, the grower put edge on it. That's the lines that you see going uh, up and across the field here. But you can see here after a significant rainfall, and this is where it probably would have been around eight, eight inches of rain over a period of, uh, of three weeks, um, you can see how, how well the soybeans uh, perform versus the dry beans in that same situation. So be selective on where you put your, uh, where you put your different uh, uh, pulse crops, make sure it's gonna be the best suited uh, for that particular pulse. And in this case here, this was just uh, an area that just received too much moisture and the ground was a little bit too heavy. The soybeans made it through okay, the dry beans did not. Um, for, for soybeans, for peas, and for dry beans, always keep in mind dry seed. Um, make sure you know what, uh, what kind of issues that, uh, um, what kind of seed quality that you have. In dry beans, uh, one of the things that can happen is with uh, dry seed, you can have mechanical damage to the seed. And instead of producing a healthy plant that you see on the right-hand side here, you see it produces a plant called a bald head where you don't have a true growing point. 
And, uh, you know, it's one thing to have one or two seeds like uh, plants come up like that. But in cases where growers have used dry seed with in combination with an air seeder and not slowing their air volume down, um, you can end up with a significant amount in the field. And that can be a real concern um, because you don't have, you know, a, a plant stand that you're looking for. So always keep in mind, ask those questions about seed, how dry your seed is, and uh, make sure that you make your adjustments accordingly to your um, to your planting to make sure you don't have any uh, any issues with uh, with bald head or any just damaged seed in general. Okay. Um, one of the last sections I want to talk about here a little bit here is uh, soybean cyst nematode. Um, just to kind of as a reminder here, um, in Manitoba we have five confirmed uh, RMs now that have. Uh, soybean cyst nematode. Uh, soybean cyst nematode is a parasitic roundworm that can uh, affect the roots of soybean plants. This is from a field from Yoram of Thompson uh, back in 2021. So in this particular instance here, you can see here, partly through the season, um, they had some IDC patches here that just didn't go away. And yet right beside you have a nice green row. And so we were called out to this field uh, to investigate further because, you know, of course, they started digging in on the roots, they found they found some cysts. So I dug a random plant, and you can see here that the nodules are quite large on here. Those are the nodules here. But these smaller little lemon-shaped cysts that you see spread throughout the root here, if you look closely, um, there is probably over 200 cysts on some of these plants. Now, what made the situation worse is, number one, there was it was not a soybean cyst nematode tolerant variety. Um, the rotation itself was okay. It was a, a one in four year rotation, but they also had dry beans mixed in as well. And uh, dry beans provide a carrier year. Um, they had a field that had um, equipment brought in from other areas that potentially could have had soybean cysts uh, in the soil particles. And also they were beside, you know, a creek that, you know, you see a lot of wildlife coming up from the U.S. and, and, uh, and stopping over. So uh, a few different things that happened in those regions. Again, here's the soybean cyst, the lemon-shaped cyst under the microscope, that lemon-shaped cyst. Basically, it cuts off the nutrients to the plant and, and uh, those above-ground symptoms it can resemble things like IDC and other things, but uh, once you start digging up your roots, that, that's what you'll see. The nodule here, nice bright and red, that's how the, the difference between them and the nodule is quite large in comparison. So what are the key message here in this situation here is where are you going to start to see soybean cyst nematode start to show up, you know, in the headlands, in, in stressed areas of the field, along fence lines, entranceways, low areas of the field. Um, you want to keep an eye open for, you know, damaged patches in the field and go and investigate. If you do see some areas, don't, uh, just don't think it's IDC, maybe it's potentially something else. Um, it was interesting with this field in the arm of Thompson. Uh, as I said, here are some of the key points that we kind of, uh, went over earlier um, on this particular field. But what they ended up doing in this field is they did some grid sampling for, uh, for the soybean cyst. And that's how they typically find them, was to look through the, the soil to see what they have. And then in this case, they actually mapped the field. So this was along the roadway here. You can see the hot spots in here. And, but if you look throughout the field, you see quite a few of those hot spots in the field as well. So this field, um, they're gonna have to manage that field a little bit differently. Um, they're going to have to maybe spread the rotation out a little bit more, grow a soybean cyst nematode variety. You can find those listings in the uh, variety description table of seed Manitoba. And, and maybe try to have a little longer rotation. Don't put dry beans on that field. Just kind of stretch things out a little bit. Some of the host crops here, um, you know, when you look at peas as, uh, peas as a host crop, dry beans are our host crop. Um, so it's just something that you need to really kind of keep in mind moving forward. Um, the last thing, just to finish off here, uh, I want to talk about Phytophthora root rot in soybeans. Uh, Phytophthora root rot can occur at any time during the growing season. Uh, when it occurs later in the season, these are the typical symptoms that you'd see on the plant. Um, you'll see the leaves start to wilt. You'll see this brown uh, um, browning on the stem kind of start moving from the base and moving up the plant. Uh, with Phytophthora root rot, those, those leaves tend to cling onto the plant. They don't fall off and eventually it kills off the plant. Um, with the, uh, a few other things, uh, just to kind of keep in mind with that is if it happens, you can use a seed treatment in spring and that will help you protect that, those seedlings, but if I talk for root raw can occur throughout the growing season. So it's something that you need to be aware of. And the next question you may ask is, 
how do you deal with it? If you do think you have it, uh, or if you want to prevent it from really causing any significant damage. Well, one of the first ways you can, one of the first things you can do is uh, pick a variety and look for if it has any major gene resistance. So the major uh, resistant genes are listed in Seed Manitoba here in their separate column. Uh, what these resistant genes means, uh, I guess in, in layman's terms, is if, if you're growing a variety that, let's say, has um, you know, 1C resistance, for example, um, and you're starting to see phytophthora root rot in that field, and you may want to change to something like a 1K just to help spread that risk around a little bit. With phytophthora root rot, typically you're going to see those symptoms in, in stressed areas of the field, lower areas, um, anywhere where the plants are, are having struggles through. It generally doesn't occur over the entire field. With that being said, I have seen a field that was severely affected back in 2011, my first summer here actually with the department. Um, but the rotation on that field was one every, one in every second year in beans. And um, at that time, uh, it was uh, just happened to be a wet spring and those symptoms really started to show up. But major gene resistance is not only is, is not the only thing you can do. You can rotate um, and keep your rotation a little longer as well. That will help things a little bit. But part of the part of the issue with major gene resistance is you don't always know what ratios you have in your field. So sometimes it's more of a trial and error. Or you can, if you want a soil test, you can have a you get a soil test for that and, and send that off as well. Another way of addressing it. But an, a, a different way to address it, and this is something that you're going to he be hearing more and more about over the over the winter months. Um, is minor gene resistance or field tolerance. Uh, many companies have developed their own reading scale for field tolerance, and uh, but we were trying to incorporate that into the seed guide and to see if we can find a standardized method so that we could rate all the varieties on the same scale. Because that is one of the problems with, with uh, the company ratings is that that rating system is, is uh, geared towards their system. So to try to move it into... Uh, a system that covers all bean types um, is, is a little bit more difficult because some companies might use a one to nine scale, uh, some might use a one to five and try to keep that uh, consistent across is, is difficult. So one of the methods that we're, we're looking at, and we've done a couple of years of work on this here now, and we uh, hopefully later this winter we'll have this year's results, but um, hydroponic work. And, and with that hydroponic work, there is a company out of uh, called AS Technologies out of, uh, out of Quebec that's been working with Manitoba pulse and soybean growers. And what we do with these samples is when we get our seed samples in for the variety testing in spring, we take a small uh, a subset of that seed and with company's permission, we send it off to this lab and in Quebec. And what they do is um, they will sow this, their seed, this seed in the uh, vermic light solution to get it started. And then they transfer it to a hydroponic system. And, uh, and inoculate it with a pea soybean mixture. And what that hydroponic system does, it has it's kind of a, a slew of almost everything that's in there, and it kind of eliminates um, all the major gene resistance. And they grow it out for for a few weeks, and then they rate the varieties. And uh, we have a check comparison. So a check comparison class is uh, this variety called Harrow, and it's a highly susceptible um, uh, to Phytophthora root rot. And here you can see the stunted plants, the brown lesions on the roots here, all the way up the plant here, highly susceptible. Going to the other end of the scale, uh, we have the tolerant lines, which basically grow through it. And um, that's where the field tolerance comes in. And you're mildly uh, uh, tolerant as your class three. So the first year when we did our experiment, uh, we did 12 lines. We looked at uh, 12 lines from different companies just to kind of see you know, how this is gonna work and if we can develop this reading scale and, and be able to post it in the guide. So uh, class one, we had one variety under the class one in that first year. We had one under class two, which is still pretty, pretty uh, uh, tolerant. Um, we had nothing in class five, and then we had lots in class three and class, and, and we had one in class four of those 12 lines that we first started with. Um, with that being said, uh, this year we tested uh, the majority of the lines. Uh, not all of them, but the majority of the lines, and we're going to be presenting that information later this winter. But um, it it looks like a lot of the a lot of the beans were coming in the class three, class four. But uh, we'll we'll enlighten you more you know, as a, as the season goes. So the advantage to something like this is when you're picking a variety from the seed guide, and you you know you've identified the variety you want for yield, and you identified the soybean system nematode resistance and the IDC scores. 
now you can say, okay, well, what kind of tol field tolerance does this variety have? Is it a class one, class two, class three? And that will help you make decisions on where to plant your soybeans given um, your soil conditions on a particular field. So it's just another tool you can use to help pick varieties. With that being said, that is my last slide for this year. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, I hope we have a few questions from the group here. So I'll turn it back over to Alana. Okay, Dennis, uh, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, there's a few questions and actually a, a good slide up there for the first question. Um, regarding water, water hemp, uh, is the sea production like, uh, like kosher, will it produce uh, seed at any height and at any time during the year? Uh, generally, it takes about two weeks from start to start to finish when it can produce seed. So um, especially that late in the season, those early plants that I, that I showed, um, and that were that kind of germinated beginning September. Um, that was probably just over two weeks worth of growth. So they can grow very quickly. Um, and you just need to be on top of that. And the difference between kosher, kosher seeds typically only, you know, they have a short viability, maybe a couple of years, whereas water hemp is, is a lot more. It's more like five to five to eight years. So again, if you see it in the fields, don't put it through the combine. Probably the biggest thing is, is get off or and better yet, Make sure that you remove it before you get to before you get to the field, so you don't spread it. Yeah, I can kind of see where that question was going. I was wondering. I think they're wondering if uh, mowing, because a lot of times we talk about mowing kosher, and it'll still produce seed. So, uh, yeah. is uh, eliminating water hemp from the field with a mower an option, or is it something that it needs to be pulled pulled out or destroyed? Ideally pulled out is, is the better way to go because then you're removing off the field. If it's at later in the season that you discover it, let's say, for example, uh, what the mowing will do is it'll drop the seed right where it sits. It's not going to spread it throughout the field. So mowing, because the plants can regrow, like you can trim plants off and it'll, they'll keep regrowing. So, you know, mowing is an, is an option for management, but really uh it's only an option if you're you know trying to eliminate stuff along the edge of the field or kill an area but you'll still have to come back and and uh and take care of it again you may have to mow it more than more than twice so a better option would be to to get the steel out and work it and and uh and kill it that way or remove it um in some fields uh, a lot of times what we see is we might only see the odd plant here and there um i had a field for example my soybeans this year were extend beans and um, looked clean all season. They were they were looking good, but along the edge of the field, along the headland, there was a grass border that I had been working all all year, and there was some pigweed in there. And I was checking, you know, looking for the smooth stem. And this one Sunday morning, I decided to um, you know uh, go for a drive in the quad. I hadn't been to the other end of the field in a while, so I took a drive, and lo and behold, I found two male plants that um, that I missed because it was just a little bit on the edge of the field. So we pulled it off. There was no seeds in it, but again, knowing what's in there and removing it is is a better way of doing it. Um, and that way, you know that it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be gone. Because if it's left unchecked, uh, I've seen a plant again in a field where um, no competition. It was a bottom of the drain, um, and the plant was probably about uh, probably about eight feet, eight to nine feet tall, and um, kind of looked like a giant Christmas tree. So I had to dig it out because even pulling it, um, you don't get all the roots. So that's that's my main thing is D digging and pulling is a better way to go, so. Okay, and we just had a comment that came in that says, uh, cut, bail, burn, but uh, like you said, cutting is not the greatest option. So chemical is the best option right now. Yeah, and, and really, you know, I think you're gonna manage it. You're gonna try to manage it through other crops. It's not just managing in the soybeans. Uh, baling it, you got to be careful with baling it um, because if you're baling with seed and that seed's going back into the barn system or whatever, that's it's it's better if you can remove it. Um, the worst field that we, uh, one of the worst fields that we had this year, um, it was spread throughout the fields um, uh, over 160 acres, and they hand pulled for over a week uh, to try to remove everything from the field because a lot of it just walking and trying to find more plants, and in the end they were upwards of five piles uh, on the edge of the field, the size of the pickup truck, not, and not just the tailgate, but the entire pickup truck. So again, there were some issues there that moved in through waterways and had been there for a little while. 
Um, but again, removing it is, and then managing it through your other, other crops um, and have a plan of attack, so. Okay, good comments. Um, how does, uh, does the cyst nematode spread like uh, club root? Well, it will spread through soil. Uh, it will, uh, and soil and water it will spread that way. Uh, initially, when we found the first fields of uh, confirmed SCN, um, they didn't actually find above ground symptoms. Um, they actually found, Mario's group found it by looking at the soil, taking it back to the lab, and they were finding it that way. And we were finding it along the Red River. Of course, you know, you're going to have floodwaters coming up. But um, the arm of Thompson field was the first time we've actually seen those symptoms, uh, above ground symptoms, because again, 2021 was a super dry year and, and that put an added stress onto it. So really, you know, you have to manage it uh, you know, like anything, just make sure that if, you, if you're bringing equipment in from other regions, clean that equipment in a specific area of the yard that uh, is not well-traveled. So you, you know, put anything into the field. Um, but just monitor your field for, for potential uh, potential risk. It's something that we can manage. We can incorporate herb, uh, resistant varieties into it to help the slow the spread. And the, the nice thing about the resistant varieties that we have now, the yields are very comparable uh, and good yields compared to our checks. Whereas when Ontario first discovered soybean cyst nematode, they were recommending just putting a variety in and taking the yield hit because those varieties at that time weren't as, uh, uh, weren't as good of a uh, yielder as their check varieties. Is there a wide range in prices between edible bean ver uh, varieties or types? Uh, yes, there is, but there's also a lot of risk between the different varieties as well. So for navies, pencils, and blacks, they're pretty consistent as far as uh, seed prices go. And contract prices right now, I've been hearing for those types are in that, uh, I think, in the 50 cent per pound range right now. The specialty beans like kidneys and crans, um, they typically have higher prices. Um, but also, they are also a lot more risk involved in that as well, because um, seed costs are higher for one. Um, yield potential, you know, when you start looking at the yields, I always find that if you want a, a, a dry bean variety that yields well, grow pintles, because um, uh, year after year, those will always be the good dependable varieties that will get you yield, and that will make up for a lot. Whereas when you're growing specialty beans, you got to look at specialized equipment for harvesting. Um, seed costs are higher, perhaps seed coat issues can be higher as well. And those are some of the factors that need to really keep in mind. Hey, and one last question is, um, and this one I, is, uh, I got from a producer and uh, he had a neighbor that's been growing green peas and having some fairly good luck with them. So he's looking at growing green peas. And I think I maybe mentioned it to you and maybe you could maybe just mention a few things that uh, producers should look at if they're gonna go to a, a green instead of a yellow pea variety. Well, uh, with the LP variety, you tend to have a lot of options when it comes to marketing because it's, it's uh, um, you know, they're, they're looking at, you know, there's bird food market, uh, or not bird food market, the dog food markets, there's protein markets. Uh, with the green peas, one of the big challenges with green, growing green peas is having a dry, uh, a dry climate to grow in a dry region. Uh, bleaching is a concern for some varieties. And um, if you have bleached green peas, then it's very difficult to sell. Now this year, there's there's a limited amount of of, of, uh, of green peas that are grown every year. Uh, if you have success with growing green peas and you can produce good quality that the buyers are wanting and good quality meaning that no no bleached uh, uh, no bleached seed, um, that's the way to go about it uh, doing it. But they they don't yield as well as what a yellow pea is. So if you're looking at strictly yellow or a yield, then uh, growing yellow yellow pea is is the way to go. Uh, just green peas can have a, a few more challenges with uh, with with marketing if you don't have a good quality, and uh, then you're going into a feed market with something that has lower value. Hey, good. Uh, thanks, Dennis. That's a good presentation on the pulse crops, and uh, interesting to see that you mentioned some new ones too that uh, I think might spark some people's attention and and uh, maybe. Uh, look at the fava bean and lupin, mar lupin market and see if there's going to be some potential there. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, just a few slides to uh, close out uh, the the set or the the day. Um, uh, reminder that uh, Ag Days is going to be on the 16th, 17th, and 18th coming up at the Keystone Center. Uh, program is online, so if you want to go grab that, it's there and available. And I think it'll be coming in the mail pretty soon. Uh, 
take it's their opportunity to come and see uh crop talk uh live and we'll be on tuesday january the 16th uh, in the morning at 9 30 in the myers norse penny theater so come and uh, visit us visit us there and listen to some of the good presenters uh also the soil fertility workshop coming in january the 23rd and 24th and january 30th and 31st. Uh, first one's in Selkirk, second one's in Brandon. This one is geared more to producers. So if you're wanting to uh, get some good information regarding soil fertility, working with the soil, uh, definitely attend those. Crop Connect conference coming up in February. So we still got some time for that one. Environmental Farm Plan, uh, it's online. Just a reminder that uh, if you haven't got your updated one or you need to update yours, uh, you can do it online and it's uh, fairly easy to do. Uh, so uh, just uh, go online and get your update done. Uh, the hay listing service, uh, still getting some calls about hay, getting some producers talking about different kinds of feed out there now. So if you've got hay for sale or you're looking to uh, buy some hay, uh, check out the site. If you have hay for sale, contact one to one of these two numbers and the people there will help you with uh, uh, getting your hay on the listing site. The crop production extension specialists in the province, uh, if you've got some questions, uh, don't be uh, afraid to call any one of these, uh, these people and uh, ask your questions. If uh, they don't know it right away, they'll be able to find out the information for you and, uh, and go from there. Uh, our livestock specialists, uh, if you're in the process of uh, going through your feed and maybe planning a feeding uh, program for the winter, uh, give any one of these a call. These people a call and they can definitely help you with that. Uh, our service centers, our service centers in uh, for MASC are located uh, in these locations and there's their numbers. So uh, feel free to call those offices at any time. There's the 1-800 numbers as well. And if you've got questions, uh, contact Lori or myself. Uh, this is gonna be the uh, last crop talk till after Ag Days. So uh, you'll be getting a notice when we get back going up again, but it'll be in February sometime. So uh, wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and uh, I'd like to thank all our speakers and all our, our uh, Prop Talk panel for, for the year for uh, making this a uh, successful year. And uh, let's start off next year with a good one. So thanks for attending and see you in the new year.